All right, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Amaya Tucha. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Horticulture at the University of Wisconsin Madison, and I'll be your moderator for the webinar today. Uh, our series, Beginning Apple Grower webinar series, is a joint effort between UW Madison, uh, the University of Minnesota Extension, the University of Illinois, and also Iowa State University. So today we will be discussing preparing a site and planting trees with Annie Claude. Annie is a statewide extension educator for fruit and vegetable production at the University of Minnesota. She works with farmers across the state, delivering research-based recommendations on growing fruit crops, including apples, grapes, berries, and pumpkins. She manages the University of Minnesota Extension Fruit and Vegetable Newsletter, and is also a co-host in this webinar series on cold climate fruit uh, production. Annie grew up on a vineyard in Iowa and has a master's degree in plant biology from Penn State University. She lives in Eden Prayer with her husband, Eugene, and daughter, Fiona, and her dog, Rusty. So thank you, Annie, for uh, preparing this webinar. I'm just going to go through a couple of um, housekeeping. First of all, keep yourself muted and your camera turned off. We will be recording this webinar. And if you have any questions, you can just go ahead and either type them on the chat box or in the Q&A. And we will be uh, addressing all of those questions at the end of Annie's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Amaya. Um, can you stop sharing your screen and I'll thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me today. So um, like Amaya said, my presentation today is going to cover preparing a site for planting and planting a new orchard. And then um, there will be subsequent sessions in the next couple of weeks on things like choosing varieties and rootstocks and building a trellis. So today we're going to be able to do a deep dive and specifically just what do you need to plan and prepare for your new orchard and how do you actually plant it? And I'm excited to be able to dive deep into this today because I feel like a lot of times um, in presentations about starting orchards, we're only able to devote a few slides to planting. And today we're gonna take a deep dive. I've got um, some videos embedded that Amaya took out at Ferguson's Orchard in 2021, and I'm excited to um, really get into it. So um, what we're going to cover today is planning out your orchard, preparing the site with things like tillage and fertilizer, some of the fundamentals of actually planting the trees. And then we're gonna look into two examples of orchards that uh, were planted. One of them is a small farm and one of them is a very large apple orchard. Things, I, I think it's useful to um, set expectations by uh, listing a couple of things that are not going to be covered today. The first is building an irrigation system. I don't have the experience to go into how to build an irrigation system. Um, and then uh, building a trellis and selecting rootstocks are things that will be covered later on in this webinar series. So if you attend the subsequent sessions, you will get information on that then. All right, so before we get into it, I wanna bring up a couple poll questions for you to answer. Um, this is so that, you know, this is a big group here today. Um, the poll questions allow you to know kind of who else is here and allows us to know who else is here and what your experience level is. Um, and so I'm just going to launch this poll question here. You should have a pop-up window on your screen right now. So just uh, select, let us know who you are. Are you a beginner apple grower, experienced? Are you thinking about starting an orchard? Are you a home gardener? Or do you maybe work for a nonprofit incubator farm or community orchard? I'll leave this up for just a few seconds here. All right, everybody responded, thanks. I'm gonna share those results so everybody can see those. Um, so we've got quite a few beginning uh, apple growers, a few experienced and um, perspective and home gardeners here today. Thanks. All right, I'm gonna bring up the next question now. Hmm. Have you planted an orchard before? 
Um, no, but I'm thinking about it. No, but I've already ordered my trees. So you're planning on planting one soon. And yes, you have planted an orchard before. Cool, I'll end the poll there and share the results. So you should be able to see that right now. Um, so about 50% uh, said no, but they're thinking about planting an orchard. That's awesome, you're in the right place. Um, no, but you've ordered your trees, also great. And yes, you've planted an orchard before. Awesome, thank you everyone for joining us. All right, so let's go on to the next slide here. The type of orchard I'm going to be focusing on today is high density orchards. Most, if not all, of the commercial orchards being planted today are being planted at high densities. What that means is the trees are anywhere between three to six feet apart in the rows. Um, they are typically uh, trellised, or if they're not trellised, they're at least um, supported by metal stakes because these are planted on dwarfing rootstocks, which allows them to stay pretty small and be planted at those high densities without the trees interrupting each other very much. Um, there are three different high density training systems. There's the tall spindle system, slender spindle, and vertical axis. Vertical axis is more like if you're just using a stake to support the tree uh, without attaching them to the trellis. Amaya will be going through, or, or someone in our series will be going through that uh, later on. So I'm not going to cover those systems today, but just to let you know and have some context, this is the system that we are um, talking in today. When you're, you're thinking about planting an orchard, here's your basic to-do list. So first, Spend a good amount of time planning it out. Think about what are your goals? Is this a hobby orchard? Is it an educational demonstration orchard? Or more likely for the audience here today, is it an orchard where you are hoping to make a profit off of the trees? And then think, am I thinking about planting cider apples? Am I gonna be selling them for processing? Or am I going to be raising those apples for the fresh market? because that will determine um, the varieties and rootstocks you use, and it will also um, potentially determine the type of trellis system that you put those trees on. You're gonna want to think about what you want your field dimensions to be and where you want that orchard to be on your property. So you wanna think about site selection. I'm not gonna be going into site selection today, but in general, we always want our orchards to be on a slight slope. Um, rather than on an extremely flat piece of land, such as the bottom of a valley. In Minnesota, most of our orchards are on slightly sloped land. Um, if you go out into the corn and soybean areas of Minnesota, you won't see many orchards out there because that land is usually pretty flat, great for corn and soybeans, but not so great for orchards because orchards like to have a slope. You're gonna think about um, then the number of trees that you're going to order based on the field dimensions and the location of the orchard. Um, I'll be going into that. Then we're gonna talk about preparing your field, soil testing, um, whether you're gonna be putting a ground cover down before you plant, such as a grass seed, fertilizing, and then think about what irrigation system you might wanna use and contract contact an irrigation contractor to get that underway. And then planting, think about things like labor. Who, who are you going to get to help you plant your orchard? Where are you going to store the trees and how are you going to stage them before they're planted? Are you gonna be tilling the whole field or just part of the field? What equipment do you have to plant? What techniques are you gonna to use to plant? And what do you need to do after the trees are physically in the ground? So part one, let's talk first about planning out your orchard. And I'm gonna use the example of a one acre high density orchard on a diversified fruit and vegetable farm. Uh, in Minnesota, we have, according to the USDA egg census, about 700 apple growers in the state. Um, a lot of those growers we suspect are growing, you know, just about an acre or so of trees on their diversified fruit and vegetable farm, maybe as another crop to add to their CSA. In Minnesota, of course, we also have many you pick orchards and farm stand type orchards. Um, and so those are, you know, anywhere between 15 and 200 acres of trees. Um, but in this example, let's just say you want to plant one acre of trees and put those apples in your CSA. 
you're going to want to put this on a high density trellis because you want to try to maximize yield per acre. And uh, research shows that high density systems such as the tall spindle system are going to yield much more per acre than our traditional low density plantings where the trees are, you know, 20 feet apart in the rows. With the high density system, the rows uh, are about 10 to 14 feet apart. The trees are three to six feet apart in row and they are on dwarf root stocks like mentioned before, and they're either staked or they're growing along a trellis. When you're thinking about the dimensions of your orchard, you also want to think about leaving buffer space for tractor turnarounds at the end of each row. So if you're looking out at your land and you have, let's say exactly one acre of space to allocate to your orchard, you're going to need to subtract some space at the ends of all of those rows in order to turn around your tractor or your four wheeler or truck, whatever it might be. Um, so you would realistically only be planting on say uh, 0.75 acres. Next, once you have your dimensions down and you figured out what square footage your space is, think about what you want your tree spacing to be in order to answer the next question of how many trees to order. So I'm guessing that Amaya is going to go into this more detail on February 23rd. So this is my only slide on tree spacing. Um, but you want to think about what the vigor of your dwarf rootstocks is. So if you're using an extremely dwarfing rootstock like the B9, um, that's going to be a better fit for tighter spacing, such as three foot spacing. Um, if you have a less vigorous variety, such as Honeycrisp or First Kiss, which are known to be less vigorous varieties, you would think about uh, tighter spacing. And same if your soil is very low in organic matter. If you are using a more vigorous dwarf rootstock, such as the G935, which is almost a semi-dwarf, or if you're using more vigorous varieties like a Sweet Tango or a Triumph, U of M's newest apple, or if your soil is very high in organic matter, you're gonna be considering spacing slightly further apart, such as four to six foot spacing within the rows. So I'll leave the rest of that to, my, to Amaya to cover on February 23rd. Cummins Nursery has this really nice chart on their website to recommend how many trees to order, uh, depending on what row spacing and what spacing you want between your trees within the rows. So for instance, and I'm sorry, I got all these webinar, uh, tabs and stuff up on my screen, so I can't see my whole screen actually. Um, but this chart on the top, it's uh, what spacing do you want between your trees? So if we say we want four feet between our trees and we want 14 feet between our rows, it's showing us that we would need to order 778 trees uh, for a one acre orchard. When you purchase trees, um, I recommend looking at wholesale nurseries, you know, Cummins who provided that chart there. That's an example of a nursery that does sell to wholesale customers. Um, look at those wholesale nurseries in order to get the best pricing. So if, you, if, if you're planting an acre and you've got 700 trees to put in the ground, um, you're probably not going to be ordering from, you know, a small garden center and paying $50 per tree. Go to those wholesale nurseries and see what pricing they can give you because their pricing for wholesale quantities is lower. Um, you're then going to select what varieties and rootstock you want. And in order to get your choice of variety and rootstock combinations for the quantity of trees that you want, we recommend ordering two years ahead of time. So, it's spring 2023 right now. So you could order trees for planting in spring of 2025 if you order them right now in order to get your choice of rootstocks and varieties. Because what the nurseries do is they will custom graft the rootstock that you want onto the variety that you want. Um, if you're somebody who's thinking about planting an orchard this spring, you're going to be really limited in what rootstock and variety combinations they have available, as well as the quantity. So for instance, I'm just going to use Commons as an example again, because I went to their website to get that chart. Um, if you say that you want, they, they say, do you want to plant this year, next year, or the year after? If you select this year, they'll show you an inventory of what they have. And I believe when I looked the other day, for instance, they had somewhere around 400 Honeycrisp trees on a B9 rootstock. Well, that's pretty limiting. You wanna order a couple of years ahead of time to get what you want. Um, and the rootstock matters a lot. So if you have soil that's pretty low in organic matter, 
and you want to plant a low vigor variety like Honeycrisp, I would not recommend just going on and getting those on a B9 rootstock because that's all that's available. It's going to be much better for you in the long term to wait to plant your orchard and get the rootstocks grafted onto those trees based on the rootstock that is going to work best for your orchard. So if you're planting in 2023, you know, consider those limiting quantities of rootstock choices and consider is it worth it for me to plant right now or is it a better idea to wait? You can also, of course, look at all of the different wholesale nurseries and see what everybody has in stock before you make that decision. And then before you plant, maybe even before you order your trees, make your entire plan. So think about not just how do I plant these trees, but think about what am I going to have to do after they're planted. Think about all of this and budget it out before you order your trees to make sure it's an endeavor that you want to go down. So um, think about if you're going to trellis your trees or if you're just going to stake them. Uh, if you're going to protect your trees with tree guards, budget that in and see if enough tree guards are even available. And then think about your irrigation system. Um, think about if you have the capabilities to set up an irrigation system this year, or if you're just going to be hand watering all your trees for the first year. But consider that when you plant your trees, they really do need to be watered in that first year in order to establish a robust root system. So let's get into part two. This part is going to be about preparing your field. And you'll have to excuse me because there are a few slides here that I've um, taken pictures of vineyards. Um, but establishing the field to plant a vineyard is very similar in a lot of ways to planting uh, a new orchard. And so even if I'm using examples from vineyards, they are were chosen because they're still applicable. A question that you'll want to ask yourself is, do I want to till the whole field in order to plant my orchard, or do I just want to till in the rows where I'm going to be planting? Um, and so there are a number of things you want to consider in order to make that decision. So the first option, uh, as you can see in the picture, just tilling uh, two foot strips in the rows where you want to plant and leaving the areas between the rows as grass. Um, so this is a pretty good choice for smaller plantings where you have small equipment such as a rototiller or a walk behind tractor. This is also really good for hills, so especially pretty steep hills where there might be a risk of erosion if you till the entire field. Um, you are reducing the risk of erosion by just tilling in the rows and leaving the areas between the rows in grass. I, I actually have seen a, a specific situation in which um, an entire field was tilled on a steep hill. They planted a vineyard on that hill. And then two days later, they had a really heavy rain and the grapevines that they had just planted literally flowed down the hill and they had to replant them. So it can happen. And I think that's something that is important to keep in mind. Um, this is a nice choice if the land is already in grasses, such as maybe it was a vegetable field before, and last fall, you seeded some perennial grass in there. You won't want to till your whole field and get rid of that perennial grass. You would want to preserve that grass you just planted and till in between. Um, same if it was pasture and you're okay with the pasture grasses that are there. Uh, a lot of people will just leave it as is and just till the rows in between. Um, you don't need to, uh, yeah, so in, in this situation, you know, if you're not going to need to spread new grass seed, then this is a good choice. But let's say the land was in um, a tall grass prairie before, and you've got a lot of really big perennial grasses with really deep root systems. That might be a situation where you want to till up the whole field and then spread grass seed. But if you don't need to do that, then this is a really good choice. This is definitely my preference if you are able to do that for a lot of the reasons stated here. So the other option is full field tillage. And this is not going to be the right choice for everybody, but there are a few situations where people prefer it. First, it's going to be easier for very, very large plantings when what the farm owns is larger equipment, um, such as you know large cultivators or large plows. It's gonna be easier to incorporate soil amendments if you till the whole field. So if you take a soil test and you find that you need to add quite a bit, and change the pH prior to planting, it's gonna be easier, especially for changing the pH and incorporating sulfur or lime if you have tilled the field beforehand. 
Um, this is a huge erosion risk on hills. Uh, it's also, you know, disturbing the native plant communities that are there, the native insect communities that are there. So, you know, if possible, I, I try to steer folks away from tilling the entire field unless they really need to. Um, if you do this, you will need to spread grass seed after planting in between those rows. Um, you'll also need to keep in mind that the soil is going to dry out pretty quickly after tilling. And so I'll get into this again later, but if you till the whole field, I really recommend minimizing the time between your last tillage and when you plant. Um, I would recommend tilling about a foot deep. Uh, if you can get a little bit deeper, that would be okay too, but you want to break up that compacted soil that's beneath the root zone of the new trees. This is particularly relevant if you are planting in a field that has not been in any sort of crop recently, such as um, maybe a residential area where it's been in turf for a number of years. That soil is going to be pretty compacted. Uh, and so you want to be able to till and break up that compaction underneath the point at which the roots of your new tree are going to hit. So um, when you dig your hole and plant your tree, you're going to be digging that hole about eight inches deep um, in order to accommodate the root system on those trees, which we'll see later in some videos. If you only till, you know, eight inches deep and that soil is really compacted afterwards, those new roots are going to have a hard time getting through that pan. Um, but if you can till deeper than the point at which you want the roots to be, then those roots are going to be able to explore through that soil and get established faster. Like I said before, I like to see people minimizing the time between their last tillage pass and when they plant. Um, and the next slide shows a really example of a really good example of why that is. Um, this is an example from a vineyard. So you'll see that the plant that he's planting in this video is a grapevine and not an apple tree, but the same principle applies. And in this situation, what happened was they tilled this field. Um, they didn't break up the soil super well, and it was it was a pretty um, like loamy soil. It really clumped together. Um, and they waited a couple days between when they tilled to when they planted. And in that time, the soil all dried up. And so they actually had to bring in topsoil in order to fill those holes so that those roots wouldn't dry out. Um, let's see the video of that. I took the sound off of this video because it's just somebody talking. So you can see he's, you know, trying to struggle with those big clods of soil. He's got that grapevine with pretty dried out root system already. And those roots need soil contact right away in order to not dry out further and in order to take up nutrients from that soil. So they actually brought in topsoil from elsewhere on their property and, uh, and planted that way. And that drastically increases the amount of time it takes to plant. So that's not something that I would recommend. And he's going to go ahead and do the same thing with this one here. So another question that folks ask is, what do I need to, uh, what fertilizer do I need to add to my field when I plant an orchard? And it really depends. Like a lot of answers that we give an extension, it depends. And this is a big one for that. It depends on what your soil test says. So you should definitely, in every instance, make sure you've done a soil test within three years of when you want to plant your orchard. After those plants go in the ground, it's going to be really hard to alter your soil pH it's also going to be somewhat difficult to alter your phosphorus and potassium concentrations in that soil. Um, and so you really need to know what your soil test looks like before you plant so that you can incorporate those nutrients and those pH amendments before you uh, put your trees in because you're not gonna be disturbing that soil after that. So take a soil test. Um, your soil test may show that your soil already has high phosphorus and potassium levels. If it does, don't add more. So if it, for instance, if you've got high P and K already, do not just go in there with like a general purpose uh, miracle Grow fertilizer because it has high concentrations of those and you do not want excess levels of those nutrients. You just want sufficient levels. Um, do you need to add manure or compost? And the answer would be, if your organic matter levels in your soil are low, um, manure and compost are great tools. If you already have, say, five, six percent organic matter, 
your organic matter is already good. You don't need to be adding more compost or manure at that time because it may lead to excess levels of these nutrients, which just end up running off and polluting our waterways. So this is an example of what a soil test report looks like from the University of Minnesota Soil Testing Lab. Um, if you get your soil test back and you look at it for a minute and you just don't understand what's on it, that is perfectly understandable. Like a lot of people would like a second opinion on their soil test report. And if you would like someone to look at your soil test report, you can contact your local extension office. You can also contact your egg co-op for information and see what information they might have. What I will say though, is that extension educators who work with fruit specialists like Amaya, for instance, have access to the expertise they need to, um, to analyze those soil reports specifically for apples. If you go to your ag co-op, typically what I hear from growers is that they went to their co-op and their co-op didn't know how to analyze their soil test report for apples. They gave them recommendations for corn and soybeans. The recommendations for corn and soybean fertilizer is much, much, much different than apples. So go to somebody who has experience working with fruit crops and can analyze your soil test report specifically for fruit. All right, so the third part that I'm gonna go into today is planting your trees. And we're gonna see some more videos in this section. Um, in 2021, Amaya was able to go out to Ferguson's Apple Orchard, which is in Minnesota and Wisconsin, and get some great videos of them planting their trees. So I'm gonna be showing those a little later. Um, so when you receive your trees, typically we are planting bare root trees. Almost always when you order them, they're going to be bare root. Uh, this is cheaper for you and it's more efficient for the uh, nursery to be producing and selling bare root trees. They are more efficient to ship because they come in large bundles, which you'll see later. These are easier to plant than potted trees because you just take them out of the bundles, you stick them into the ground and backfill the soil over the root ball. Um, so if you get your, your bare root trees uh, and they are on dwarfing root stalks, these should produce fruit within three years of planting. Um, it, they might even start producing fruit before you want them to produce fruit because you want them to get to their final height before you allow fruit on those trees. Um, but my point is they produce fruit pretty readily versus if you get a semi-dwarf or a standard sized tree, those are typically not producing for another seven years. So um, an example, I had a grower ask me, they, a grower that wanted to plant uh, first kiss trees in their orchard or rave, uh, as it's known outside of Minnesota. And they said the nursery has semi-dwarf root stock trees available this year, but they have dwarf root stock trees available next year. Should I go ahead and order the semi-dwarf trees this year? And what I told them is you could go ahead and order those trees, but those trees that are on semi-dwarf root stocks are typically gonna take longer to start producing fruit than the dwarf ones. So you might as well wait until next year or order those dwarf root stock trees. They would, both types would probably start producing fruit in say 2027, and you're going to get higher yields per acre with the dwarf fruit stock trees, even if you're planting them later. So that was what I would recommended in that case. You can also plant potted trees for sure, um, but they're gonna be more expensive to buy. Uh, they take more time and care to plant because you need to make sure you're not breaking that, uh, that trunk at the graft union when you take it out of the pot. Um, and you'll need to wait to allow fruit until um, about two years after planting. So why would you choose this option? Um, people run into this situation every once in a while. Um, first is if there's no bare root trees available, but you wanna get trees in the ground. Second, if you grafted uh, the trees yourself, um, there might be other reasons like, hey, I just wanted four trees in my backyard um, and this is what was available nearby. All right, so another planting fundamentals to plant in mid to late May in our region. Um, there are a couple issues with planting in June. The first is that the weather by that point has often gotten a lot drier than it was in May. Uh, so those you're gonna have to water your trees more and there's just less time for those trees to acclimate to winter. So we try to you know, wait until the soil is above 40 or 50 degrees in the spring. However, you also um, don't wanna wait too long because you wanna allow as much time as possible for those trees to grow and acclimate for the winter. 
Before you plant, the plants should be stored in a walk-in cooler or refrigerator between the time when you receive them from the nursery and when you plant them. And often the nursery, when you order the trees, will ask you when you want them delivered. And I would select a, de a delivery date in mid to late May. If you're in Minnesota, you might be able to get them a little bit earlier if you're in Wisconsin, depending on where in Wisconsin you are. All right, so let's watch a video here. Um, this is of, uh, he's going to be discussing how the plants came in from the nursery and how they are stored and staged prior to planting. So all these trees that we get from the nursery, they come in crates pretty similar to this. Some have the sawdust, some are bare root, um, but pretty much none have soil on them. So it's really important to us that we don't get any drying of the root system before we put them in the ground. So if we come across different nursery that doesn't prep their trees like this, uh, you may look at putting a water tank or something here to dip the roots into before they go into the ground so they're not drying out. But what we like to do is not keep our trees exposed for very long. Um, on this plastic here, it's got wet, moist sawdust that keeps our roots wet, and we try and not expose the root system until they're going right onto the planter and going into the ground. So he'll keep these bundles together as long as he can until they're going right into the ground. So any downtime that we have, you know, if we're at the end of a row and it's going to be a long time before he's pulling out again, they get covered back up. And we kind of lucked out today with it being cloudy and not sun directly beating on them. Even right now, he would cover them up if there was a lot of sunlight here. All right, and I'm going to show the rest of that video a little later on. But you also got kind of a, a sample of how they're planting their trees at Ferguson's Apple Orchard. So all these trees that we get from the nursery. All right, when you um, receive those trees uh, and you're ready to plant them, you know, you're going to take them out of the bins. And the next question that I get a lot is, how deep do you want to dig the hole? I sometimes see people taking an auger and digging like a four foot deep hole um, and then backfilling that hole and then planting the tree at the depth of the root ball. Um, that's something that you can do. Uh, the disadvantage of that is when you use an auger, it creates this really compacted soil all around the, the cylinder that the auger forms essentially. And so what I like better is to till the soil like we talked about before. And then as long as that soil is tilled to about a foot deep, you can just dig a small hole uh, in order to fit your root ball in and then cover it right back up. Um, so the point that I'm trying to make in this slide is basically you want to get that soil loosened beyond the depth of the root ball, but you don't necessarily need to use an auger to dig a super deep hole. Another planting fundamental is that when you receive your trees, you know, these are going to be grafted trees. You need that graft union to be about three to five inches above the soil surface, or in other words, you need that root ball to be right below the soil surface and not bury too much of your stem. Um, you don't want a lot of, you know, suckers coming up from the, um, from below the graft union, but you definitely, the most important thing is you don't want your graft union to be underneath the soil because what's going to happen then is um, you're just going to get a lot of genetics of that, um, of that rootstock um, in your tree. So you want your rootstock to be above the soil surface. After you plant, you want to be watering the same day as planting unless it's going to rain. You might need to bring a water tank out with you or have your irrigation already set up, but that's not usually possible until after planting and trellis is constructed. Um, the trellis system, if you are using one, should be constructed as soon as possible after planting, and then the irrigation system should be constructed as soon as possible as well. And I'm, again, I'm not going to go into trellising today. So here's one case study. This is a one acre um, high density fruit planting at the U of M Horticulture Research Center. This is an example where, like I said before, I'm gonna be using some examples from vineyards. This is actually a vineyard that they were planting, um, but they were planting it at very similar spacing to an orchard and a lot of the same principles applied. So he was using um, a two foot, you know, a, a rototiller or a walk behind tractor to till these two foot wide rows. And that's where we were planting into. And he actually took, uh, three passes with the walk behind tractor over each row in order to make sure that that soil was really tilled up. This is a, just a short video clip that I'm going to play of that.
So you can see, you know, his arms are shaking quite a bit um, just with this piece of equipment. So if a walk behind tractor is what you have, uh, that's best for a small planting. I, I'm sure John wouldn't want to do more than, you know, an acre, half an acre with that. Supplies you need for this um, in a really small planting or just after you till up your rows, you just need shovels. You need a tape measure to make sure the spacing between your trees is consistent. And then you need a number of friends or employees to help you plant that. So here's just a picture of planting. You can see she just, um, somebody came before her and used a shovel to dig that small hole. She's putting, in this case, the grapevine into the hole at the depth of that root ball and covering it back up. And since that soil is nicely tilled, those plants are gonna have a good start. So this is John uh, demonstrating for us how to plant that grapevine, um, in our case, an apple tree. The only difference here is with an apple tree, just pay attention to where that, uh, that graft union is and make sure the graft union is three to five feet above the soil surface. Um, but the way that John is, you know, kind of making sure the soil is level, um, and then he kind of pats down the area around the plant a little bit in order to help rain uh, collect at the base of that tree uh, to to minim to maximize those uh, precipitation events. So that's basically it. It doesn't need to be complicated. Um, case study number two. Let's look at a large scale high density planting, and we're going to show some videos here. This is at Ferguson's Apple Orchard in Lake City, Minnesota, where in 2021 they were putting in a new planting. Um, so this is just, you know, kind of setting the stage here. This is what we're dealing with, a fully tilled and prepared field. They'd already fertilized and gotten their pH where they wanted it. It looks like it was in a crop the year before. Um, and he's got, you know, a fairly large crew out helping plant, and they are planting from behind a tractor. So I'm going to skip to part of this video that we hadn't watched yet and um he is just going to uh start explaining what they did with the trees after they got them out of the bundles so the other important thing on these when he pulls these bundles out sometimes the trees are six six feet plus that the the tip of the tree is actually curved over. So he's got to take a lot of care pulling them out that he's not breaking any trees in half and, and anything like that and being very careful with them. All right. We're gonna go on to the next video and this one really shows how they are planted into these tilled rows. So how we do this is we use a three-point tree planter. Um, we have one tree planter in the center and he's guiding it in our trench that the tree planter makes. And so we, we constantly check our depth, which is three feet across. And then we constantly check our depth of our trench hole. And we have it automatic to where it constantly puts it in the same depth every time once we find a distance that we like. The guys around it, they're more just supplying everything to that one person to keep up with him. And so we like to plant as fast as we can, but be as careful as we can. So this guy here, he's just constantly holding them up for our planter to gauge where our three foot mark is. Everyone else is just making sure that once the trench closes in with the brutal, brittle rootstock, we're not collapsing the tree and breaking the scion wood. So we're trying to keep everything as straight and secure as we can all the way out to the to get to this point where we have guys coming behind, checking our depth and stomping on the trees. All right. And this is just a clip that shows from the other end. Um, I thought this one was really interesting. I know a lot of people on this call are probably not going to be planting, you know, and uh, with this sort of implement, but I just think it's really interesting to watch. So everyone on the crew has one small and important job 
in order to get everything done. And this is a, you know, as you can see, this is a much more efficient way of planting than how most of us plant on very small acreages. Okay, so now he's gonna demonstrate um, what to do after the plants are in the ground, just to check and make sure that they are all in there correctly. So these trees just got planted. Um, and so once they're put in, the guys kind of kick the berm back and they stomp. While they're doing that, they're checking their depth. And so what we like to say is three fingers is our planting height um, from our graft union. And so we measure three fingers to make sure we don't have any um, rooting going on and we get you know, non-semi-dwarf trees. All right, um, so then after planting, there are a number of things that uh, you need to consider next. We're not quite done yet. Um, first is irrigation or watering. So you wanna get water on those trees as soon as possible after planting, especially if you don't have rain in the forecast that day. For a lot of folks, that's gonna mean taking a water tank out to the field and just slowly driving it down the rows. Um, you're usually not gonna be able to get your irrigation system installed right away because that is drip irrigation that is attached along the trellis and you haven't installed your trellis quite yet. Um, you're gonna be trimming some of the long shoots off, the, off of the trees if needed. If there are really long shoots competing with the central leader of the tree, we'll get into that in a second. You're gonna be installing tree guards most likely and then think about your stakes or your trellis after that. So here's a picture of um, the tree guards on the trees after planting. This is still at Ferguson's Apple Orchard, that same place we were just looking at. There are several options of tree guards or wraps. Um, this one in the middle, this corrugated plastic, this is what the majority of apple growers use. Um, you can use these plastic ones on the left. Uh, this is really nice for letting air flow through, uh, through them and there's less chance of insects building nests inside those wraps. Um, this third one is the spiral wrap, and a lot of growers do not prefer this one. They're, the issue with them is that the tree's trunks are going to grow pretty quickly, and typically these spiral guards tend to girdle the trees as the trunks grow too large. And so these are only really feasible if you're willing to go in there frequently and loosen them up. Uh, so most folks just prefer these corrugated plastic ones, and then they can be taken off once the trunks are wide enough. For trunk guards on our trees, um, we use these thicker walled um, PVC kind of almost corrugated um, tubing that we've, we really like. And we've tried many different types of them. Um, the reason we've gone this route is internal diameter is about three inches. So, you know, when the trees are nine, nine years old, we'll maybe have to think about pulling these off and using them on another block. Um, but the reason we like these is one, the airflow in the trunk, um, it doesn't tighten around the trunk of the tree, creating wet bark that creates rot and fungus growth. Um, as well as down here, um, there's such a, a solid seal once we come through and and rake out this dirt and everything um, for mouse control, rabbits, things like that, uh, that we like. And then we use the solid ones for our herbicide strips. So this allows us to use different herbicides for our weed strips um, without fear of contacting the, the bark on the new trees. And so it gives us more options uh, moving forward in year one through four uh, without worrying about killing the tree. For all right, so now um, what he's going to be talking about is trimming some of the shoots um, off of those trees. You know, usually they're pretty much just a stick, um, but they do have a few little shoots coming off of them. And so he's going to talk about just pruning those off so that you can get the tree guards on. So when we're looking at putting these on, um, prior to coming with the trunk guards, we have guys coming in here and clipping our branches back. So any any big branches or any branches that are gonna compete with our terminal, um, we like to take off and remove, um, leaving a long enough span. Uh, but specifically for the trunk guards, we like to come and flush cut any branch that is gonna be below this. So this was here. We like to flush cut any of those so we don't have any shoots coming off and any low branches that are gonna be 
coming up in here, which are hard to prune out. And then I'm not going to get into stakes, but just um, just for context, you know, the next step would be to stake those trees. Um, a lot of dwarf trees are going to require stakes. Um, some semi-dwarf trees require stakes as well. This is just because uh, those graft unions, you know, they could break, especially in the wind, um, especially something like a B9 that the super dwarfing rootstocks, um, those are pretty brittle and they have been known to break without stakes. So we recommend uh, staking, if not trellising those trees. Um, you're gonna wanna get stakes that are at least six feet above ground if you're just using them temporarily. If those stakes are gonna be there permanently, uh, you'll want them to be at least 10 to 12 feet above ground so that the entire tree's uh, height can be staked. Uh, this is a picture of irrigation piping going in in an orchard. Again, I'm not an irrigation expert, so I won't get into that. I'll leave that to the pros. Um, but my point being, I, I really like to see orchards using irrigation, um, especially if you're using dwarf trees and you're trellising them. Um, they really are meant to be irrigated. It's um, Your yield is going to suffer without that irrigation on dwarfing rootstocks and the establishment of those trees is going to suffer. And so we do definitely see physical differences out in the field. And I just really recommend if you are thinking about putting in an orchard uh, on dwarf root stocks and trellising it, I really recommend putting in that drip irrigation system. First year weed control is also really important. Um, when you put those new trees in the ground, their root systems are so tiny, as you saw in the pictures of the bare root trees. Um, those tiny root systems have a really hard time competing with weeds, grass, or even you know cover crops that are growing around the base of those trees. So it's a must to keep those rows uh, weed free for the first couple years while the trees are trying to establish themselves. Uh, we know that ignoring weed control can set the trees back for at least one year because it competes so much with how much the trees are able to grow. Um, so that if you're you know, trying to save money by not controlling weeds, um, the amount that it sets the trees back is really gonna negate any money saving, any money that was saved on not weeding. Um, if you're somebody who's looking into putting a cover crop underneath your trees, you know, cover crops are something that I'm really interested in. I studied that for my master's degree. Despite that, I don't recommend doing that until the trees are in year four or five. It just, again, leaving those trees time to establish themselves before you introduce something that's going to compete with them. There are a couple of alternatives to herbicides, and this isn't a weed management talk, so I'm not going to get into it, but um, if you're sitting there thinking, well, I don't want to do herbicides, I'm not comfortable with it, I would like an alternative, you know, there all are some alternatives, those alternatives also have issues, um, but, you know, you could use wood chip mulch uh, underneath those trees, make sure it's a nice thick layer of mulch, um, at least two to three inches. Over time, Perennial weeds especially are going to start growing up through that mulch, but it can do a really good job of protecting those trees from weeds, especially in their establishment phase. I do know of two orchards here in Minnesota that are using 20-year uh, landscape fabric underneath their trees. And so that's something you can try as well. I do want to mention that over time, some weeds such as thistles and quackgrass have been known to come up through um, the webbing in that landscape fabric. So it's not foolproof, but there are alternatives to herbicides. So highlights from today, um, big orchard or small orchards, the same fundamentals apply. Uh, till that soil well right before planting, take a soil test to know if you need to fertilize, store those trees in a cool area before you plant them, keep that graft union three to five inches above the soil line when you plant, and then water them as soon as possible after planting. The how you do that is going to depend on what equipment you have and what scale you're planting at, as we saw in the videos. After planting, uh, get those trees watered as soon as possible. Um, already know before you plant what your plan is for trellising or staking. Put up those tree guards if you want them. You might need to trim your trees a little bit in order to get those tree guards on and then think about what you're going to do for weed control. And that is all I have for you guys today. Um, if you want more information from University of Minnesota on how to um, grow and produce apple trees, we have a lot of information in our fruit and vegetable newsletter or on the website. You can call your local county extension educator as well, and they can either answer the question or direct you to the correct person to answer the question. And my email address is listed as well. Great. That was a great talk. Thank you so much, Annie. That was a lot of information. 
I love the way that you, you know, put it in order of all the things that are necessary to think about and plan before planting an orchard. I will put again in the chat the link of where the recording of this uh, webinar are going to be posted. There's two different sites that you can go and find it in case you want to go back and uh, look at some of the great information that Annie shared with us. We have some um, questions in the chat here. If you have questions, please go ahead and type them and I will uh, start reading them and we can, we can discuss with Annie what's the best uh, answer for your questions. The first one is from Chris and uh, he's asking, do you have an estimate of plant to fruit for trees on semi-standard rootstocks like MN111? And I assume that this is how long it takes for from planting to start producing fruit. Oh, okay. It can be anywhere between five to 10 years. And it can be quite variable between that yeah. range. Yeah. The the more standard the rootstock, the longer it's going to take for those rootstocks to start producing fruit. Yeah. Okay. I don't really recommend standard. I mean, uh, even for home gardeners, unless your goal is to just have a shade tree, I don't recommend buying them just as own rooted standard trees um, because even the semi dwarf rootstock trees those could be 20 feet tall um, what happens when people plant standard size trees is they're usually frustrated that they can't get the fruit at the top of the tree you also can't do any insect pest management or disease management at the top of a 20 30 foot tree um, so i just want to mention that and that's why we focus on talking about the dwarfing rootstocks because for most people i work with the dwarf rootstock trees or at least a small semi-dwarf is what's most relevant to, to our audiences. Yeah, that's, that's correct. All right, so let's keep going here with the next question. John asked, the pain mark on the bare root, which way should that be placed, sun side or shade side? Oh, um, like the graft union or? I think that that's, that's what they're referring to. Amaya, do you have an answer to that one? Because I've heard a lot yes. of different answers to that question. Yes. In general, you know, the recommendation of Annie to use uh, those those tree guards, that's the reason why we want to use them. So uh, you can paint your trees, and that is specifically for uh, sun exposure and cold damage. So when if you don't paint them uh, white, they get can get really hot during the day in the winter. And then when it's really cold over the night, you can get those trunks to split. So if you're gonna paint them, you're gonna paint them all around. Uh, but one way of, of bypassing that is to use those guard um, uh, around the trees, which have a lot more um, functions than just protecting from sun scald and sun damage in the winter. Uh, they, again, they protect from you know, the herbicides that you might be uh, putting in there, which is really important. And so I preferably would recommend you to go ahead and invest on those tree guards. Also, it protects from rodents chewing on the bark of your, of your tree, which is not a minor issue. And over uh, just going ahead the chip way and just painting them white all around uh, the trunk. All right. The next question that we have here is from Erica and uh, is, do you recommend fumigation? Um, so in Minnesota, we're not really recommending fumigation. I don't know what the recommendations are in Wisconsin for that, but speaking for Minnesota growers, no. Um, it's typically just not necessary. So Amaya, what would you say about that for Wisconsin? I absolutely agree. The problem with fumig fumigation, there's two big problems. One there are very few chemicals available to do that type of fumigation, and you need a specialized equipment to inject that, that uh, chemical in the soil. The second one is that you would only think about fumigating when you have a replant situation. You had an orchard, an apple orchard, and you're replanting in the same site. Um, however, when we fumigate, we need to think about we are basically killing everything in the soil, not only the pathogens in there, but also the beneficial microorganisms that I have there. If you go ahead and you kill all of them, what do you think is going to recolonize those, you know, mm -hmm. now clean soils? It's going to be pathogens. And so we really don't recommend that. We do have Thankfully, on apples, which is an exception for the majority of the of the fruit crops, we do have uh, apple rootstocks that are resistant 
to replant disease or somehow tolerant to replant disease. And so that would be a much better alternative than thinking about um, fumigating. All right, the next question is, what is the preferred method of tree protection in high deer density areas? Deer fence, for sure. Um, it's in Minnesota, it's just a general broad recommendation that if you're putting in an apple orchard, you should budget in a deer fence. We don't really have any reliable methods other than a deer fence. I mean, um, I've heard of home gardeners hanging up soap on trees. We have no idea if that actually works. Um, so deer fence is the answer. It is very expensive, but I think that's just something that you have to budget in and then you're even more motivated to make sure that you're managing your trees well and planting on the right rootstocks to make sure that you're getting high yields per acre to um, account for all of those upfront costs. All right, next one from Patrick is, what would you recommend for ground cover in a field coming out of row crops with a clover cover crop? Sure, yeah, great question. Um, often we're just putting down like a fine fescue mix um, and that's probably a lot of what we have here. Um, so fine fescue is an example of a cool season grass, um, something that is not too expensive, but is also not going to grow super tall. Um, the reason why I really like fine fescues out of um, all of the different cool season grasses is those are considered no mo or low mo grasses. So they typically just grow about eight inches tall, kind of flop over on themselves, and they don't require mowing very often. Um, you could also incorporate some clover into your grass mix if you would like, you know, for just a little extra nitrogen fixation in the soil. Really nothing wrong with that. Sounds good. Okay, the next one is uh, for dwarf and semi-dwarf, how long do trees typically live? How, oh, how long do they typically live? Mm -hmm. Um, I saw somebody just log on to this webinar who's been growing apples for a very, very, very long time in Minnesota, and he would probably have a great answer to that. Um, I, I mean, we haven't been growing it, dwarf rootstock trees that long in Minnesota. And so in our climate, I think it's probably shorter than the typical lifespan in warmer climates. Um, you know, I've seen them live 20 years before folks like to be replacing them. And if you are growing a, uh, a variety that is more hardy, it's typically, or on a hardier rootstock, it's going to last longer. Basically what causes those trees to decline a lot of the time in Minnesota is since it's so cold, they get winter injury. And over time that winter injury slowly and slowly chips away at the tree. Um, Amaya, how long have you seen dwarf rootstock trees surviving in Wisconsin? Uh, you know, anywhere between 25 to 30 years, if the trees are healthy and, you know, as you would say, like the, the amount of cold damage that they experience is not that much, they should be able to continue to live and produce for that amount. Now, what happens is that in the last 30 years, there has been such a radical change in the way that we grow apple trees and how we produce the system with all these changes that what ends up happening is either the growers decide to renovate a block because it's not really economically viable anymore rather than that the trees are showing you know signs that they're decaying and that they're not producing enough so that's the reason why sometimes blocks will come out of the crop production more to you know change to new cultivars that are, are um, more popular or changing growing practices that make uh, it more efficient uh, in every system from, you know, le levels of yields to also mechanization, which is, has been a big change in the last, you know, 30 years. Yeah. And Amaya, I live. feel like because people usually take their blocks of trees out before the end of their lifespan, it makes it hard for us to answer the question of what is their mm -hmm. lifespan, because uh, especially here when we haven't been growing dwarf rootstock trees for that long, we, a lot of the time, we just haven't seen them to the end of their life. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't yeah. give them a chance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of more questions, but before everybody, you know, goes away, I just want to launch a, a, a poll that we have with some information, and then we're going to go back to some of the questions that we have there in the chat. And so, Josie, could you launch those questions that you have for the audience? Okay, so this is really helpful feedback for us, if you can help us by answering this. They're mostly related about, you know, the webinar that you just uh, attended, and how can we make things better? So if you just want to go ahead and, and start answering. 
then we can move on to uh, continue with the questions that we have in the chat box. All right, so maybe in the meantime, as people are answering those questions, let me ask you, Annie, the next one is, uh, any thoughts on 3D electric deer fence idea? Oh, I don't have enough expertise with that, sorry. Yeah, me neither, I don't, I don't have a good answer for that, I'm sorry. It's certainly a good uh, question. I would reach out to like, if, uh, if you're in Minnesota, we do have a wildlife specialist in extension. Um, uh, Jeff Logering, or sorry, John Logering is his name, and he would know the answer to that. Great. So here there's an, another a comment following up that same one. This is uh, Angela says, I used a 3D fence around a garlic field and the deer had been eating uh, and it would and it worked at keeping them out the rest of the season. Nice. So yeah, it's like it will work. Nice. All right. Um, Next question again regarding the paint mark question. Uh, some growers place a paint mark on their product to indicate uh, which side face the sun. I really don't think that this is a that this is a big issue on what side you put it or not. I think that the real issue here is whether you're going to paint the entire trunk or not, or you're going to use a, a tree guard. And so, as I said before, my recommendation would be to use a tree guard. Annie, I don't know if you have any any other comments yeah. about that. Yeah, I recommend using a tree guard too, because then you're not only getting the sun protection benefit, but you're also getting the vole protection benefit. Which is it's not something to take lightly. It can be a major, major loss of your trees, uh, damage uh, by voles and any other rodents. All right. Um, the next question is, at what age of the tree can you stop using the tree guards? I would stop using the tree guards um, once they start getting too big for the tree guards. So that might happen after five years, might happen after seven years. But yeah, you definitely don't want to get the point where um, those trunks are as wide as the tree guards and they're going to start brushing up on them. Then you're going to be girdling them. So after a few years, you're just going to see that it's naturally time to take them off. Perfect. Okay, more questions about uh, weed management. Any thoughts on square plastic weed mats, three by three, four by four plastic with a hole in the middle for the tree? Um, I have not seen those. They, they sound like they could certainly work um, depending on what material it is. They sound expensive in a, if you were gonna use them large scale, but if what you have is, you know, a few trees, in your backyard that that sounds good as long as the material is really heavy duty i agree i agree but on a on a larger scale they're probably you know too expensive all right the next one is um we aren't planting this year uh is there something we should start planting this year to uh, this is a difficult question to read i assume that is There about something that they should be planning for maybe planting this year or next year so it's it, now it's you know we're in february and you want to plant next spring what would be the things that you should be you know working on yeah great question um i think i would take a soil test this spring and then have your soil test analyzed by a couple of people who are really knowledgeable in that area um such as your university soil health extension person. Um, and then you have plenty of time to do your soil amendments. The reason I would make sure to do that this spring is if you do your soil test and you find out that your soil pH is too high, uh, it's gonna take a while for you to apply sulfur and that sulfur to actually reduce your pH. Um, so make sure you do it sooner rather than later. Um, and then as far as planting, what might you plant? Um, you could do, um, if you wanted to, you could do it like an annual cover crop for the summer. Uh, if you think you want to fix nitrogen or you just want to increase organic matter in that soil, you could plant a really, uh, a really thick cover crop mix. 
Um, but otherwise I would go ahead and just get the grass established in that field that you're going to want to have throughout the life of your orchard. Um, so like a fine fescue mix. And then when you're ready to plant next spring, you would just till in the rows where you want to plant rather than tilling the whole field. Good question. Yeah, I know that some of the folks uh, joined late, um, but I'm going to put again here where the recording of the webinar is going to be because Annie did actually go through those steps that you need to be thinking about two years before you plant. So here, here's where we're going to be posting it, um, those, uh, the recording. The next question is, again, about tree guards. Um, can you take the tree guards off in the summer and put them back on in the winter to prevent uh, rodent damage? Yep, you absolutely can. It's a lot of work. And yeah. so again, this is where the scale is really important. Is it really worth it to do uh, uh, this kind of, this kind of uh, labor um, or not? But if you have a small orchard or you just have some trees in your backyard, that is, that is totally fine. Um, any tricks for removing tree guards to reduce damage to the trunk? Um, well, when you remove them, I mean, they, you know, they open up on one end, so you just kind of spread it out and take them off. Um, I'm curious if the person that asked that question has had an issue with it before. I have never personally had an issue with it. I just yeah. able to kind of pull it off and that's it. Yeah, and there's so many different types of those tree guards. Uh, as Annie was showing some of them, uh, and certainly there's some that are easier to put on and take them off than others. We have one last question. I'm gonna read it, but no pressure, Annie, to answer this one because I think it's mostly related with insect control and it's not really what the, the theme of the, this webinar is about, but they're asking if there's any tips for recurring aphids ants on a home urban apple tree. Uh, water soap sprays has helped some. Yeah, sorry. And I don't have a lot of experience with aphids. If it were a question about other insect pests, I might be able to answer it today, but I'm not prepared to answer that one right now. Sorry. Yeah. Here's where, where you know, I think that Annie, uh, you know, said this multiple times in her presentation, content your local horticulture educator. Uh, that is the best way. If you still have a lot of questions uh, after this webinar, or you probably have more questions after this webinar, one way of doing it is either contacting your horticulture educator or your extension person in your county and, and they will go and contact the specialist if they are not able to answer your questions but they're very knowledgeable and sometimes most of the times they will have answers uh, for these questions so it's uh almost nine minutes past the hour i just want to really thank annie for her wonderful presentation just remind everybody that the recordings we're going to be posting the recording of this webinar if you want to go back and look at it uh, and that we have a lot more webinars coming up in this series i don't remember exactly when the next one is oh and there we go so on february 23rd we'll have uh, the next series going to be choosing road socks and ordering trees followed by training and trellising systems Pest management with trapping and monitoring and designing a spray program for disease control. All of this in the beginner apple grower. So stay tuned uh, and you can go and uh, you can um, find these webinars in our uh, website. I'm going to put it here in the chat where you can um, register for these upcoming webinars. And with that, thank you very much for attending. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amaya and Josie. Bye.